At over 12.15 teflops and over 10.28 teflops respectively, the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 deliver an unprecedented level of raw console performance. They're a true generational leap over the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4. However, the very fact that they're the ninth generation consoles is telling. This is the fourth straight console generation built from the ground up for 3D video game environments. As we speculate about the possibilities, what kinds of environments we will see in the 9th gen games, what kind of rendering techniques they'll use, it's a good idea to look back at previous generations. What kind of performance uplift did we see between each of the earlier 3D rendering console generations? How were expectations set, and were they met or exceeded? 5th to 6th gen, the first 3D transition. Till date, the single greatest generational leap in fidelity and capability was between the 5th generation consoles and the 6th generation. Barring the commercial failures that were the Atari Jaguar and the 3DO, the Sega Saturn, PlayStation 1, and Nintendo 64 were the first consoles built around the idea of 3D graphics, barring again earlier experiments like Nintendo's Super FX add-on chip and the failed Atari Jaguar and 3DO consoles. The Saturn was the first of the three to market back in 1994, the weakest in terms of capabilities, and the first to be discontinued. Sony's PlayStation 1 arrived the year after, and the Nintendo 64 finally turned up in 1996. These were the first consoles to support fully 3D game environments with shaded and textured polygons. Earlier efforts compromised on the 3D aspect somewhere or the other. Star Fox on the SNES, for instance, used flat shading, each polygon on screen was shaded with just a single color. Doom in titles like Alien vs Predator on the Atari Jaguar, on the other hand, featured textured and lit environments but relied on 2D sprites for character models. The PlayStation 1, Nintendo 64, and Sega Saturn delivered fully realized 3D worlds with 3D environmental and character assets. They pioneered entirely new genres like the 3D platformer, Super Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot being early examples. And yet, relative to modern hardware, these were still incredibly primitive consoles. The N64, the most powerful 5th generation console, could deliver just 100 mflops of compute performance. Xbox Series X is, believe it or not, over 100,000 times faster. While 5th generation game worlds were full 3D, the console simply lacked the power to deliver animation, models, or environments that even remotely approximated real life. High-quality 2D visuals in SNES games like Radical Dreamers were just truer to life, even if they were bound to a flat plane. The real leap in fidelity was only to come. The Dreamcast, PlayStation 2, and Xbox – Recognizably Modern While these 6th gen consoles are weak in comparison to modern hardware, the Xbox Series X can crunch numbers about 500 times faster than the original 20G flop Xbox, 6th gen internals were fast enough to deliver the first recognizably modern games. Most modern gameplay tropes and genres evolved during the 6th generation. Released at the end of 1999, Shinmu on the 1.4 G-Flop Dreamcast was the first recognizably modern 3D open world title. Everything from the Grand Theft Auto series to Ubisoft's open worlds to No Man's Sky owes a debt to Yu Suzuki's masterpiece. Character models and animation were detailed enough that players could actually relate to the emotion showcased in real-time cutscenes. The world itself was unprecedentedly massive, an almost two-scale rendering of suburban Japan. Other titles this generation, from Metal Gear Solid 3 on the PS2 to Halo on the Xbox, are, again, templates for generations of newer games. Visually, games of this era don't always hold up that well. However, for better or for worse, the core gameplay loops we're used to now, things like fetch quests and RPGs, turret missions and FPSs, and more, all started right here. And thanks to the proliferation of mobile ports of a number of 6th gen classics, many of these games remain visible to this day. The 6.2 G-Flop PS2, the weakest of the 6th gen consoles barring the Dreamcast, interestingly had the greatest staying power, with new units being sold into the 2010s. Studios like Kojima Productions leveraged close ties with Sony to squeeze the most out of the console. Metal Gear Solid 3 delivered some of the most stunning dynamic lighting seen in a video game till date. Rockstar in particular has diligently ported over nearly all of their high-profile 6th generation titles, barring the controversial Manhunt series. 
Max Payne, Grand Theft Auto, and Bully feel just as good to play on an iPhone 11 Pro Max as they did on the PlayStation 2 a decade or more earlier. At a technical level, we saw the first use here of ragdoll physics, as well as real-time shadowing, dynamic lighting, normal mapping, and many other technical hallmarks of modern titles. Nintendo's 9.4 G-Flop GameCube was the console maker's last attempt at class-leading performance. The GameCube's Flipper GPU enabled developers to deliver classics like Resident Evil 4. That particular game's subpar PS2 port, with muddy textures, a low resolution, and missing effects, shows just how much more was possible on Nintendo's hardware. The original Xbox delivered 20 G-Flops of compute, making it over three times faster than the PS2, and was the last entrant in the sixth generation race. However, the high-performance PC-derived CPU and GPU combo enabled Microsoft's console to punch above its weight. Between 2004 and 2006, a number of transitional titles like Doom 3 and Half-Life 2 that eventually made their way over to the 7th gen consoles debuted on the original Xbox, albeit at 480p resolution. The PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Moore's Law begins to collapse. There is a reason why the Xbox Series X delivers only a 10 times performance uplift over the Xbox 360, and not the insane jumps seen in earlier generations. The exponential rate at which transistor density increased, termed Moore's Law, has slowed down and, at present, completely collapsed. While the leap to the 7th gen consoles was still transformative, everything after has been an evolution, not revolution. Both the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 delivered a comparable level of performance, 240 G-flops in the Xbox 360's case and 230.4 G-flops for the PS3. However, they achieved this in different ways. The PlayStation 3's RSX GPU was relatively weak. Instead, developers offloaded graphics work to the SPUs on its cell processor. Making full use of cell was critical to PS3 success. This is something that Naughty Dog managed with The Last of Us. The Xbox 360 had a more conventional setup, with a triple-core PowerPC CPU and a Xenos GPU based on an ATI design. In terms of gameplay, there were a few things that the leap to the 7th gen enabled that were not possible before. The increased CPU power allowed for large-scale NPC simulations, enabling games in the Assassin's Creed and Dead Rising franchises to have hundreds of characters on screen at one time. From a technical perspective, features like ragdoll physics and real-time lighting, which were Halo features in the handful of 6th gen titles, including, well, the Halo franchise, became standard. Overall, the move to consoles with circa 200 G-flops of floating point power resulted in a refinement of the gameplay approaches developers took in the previous generation. The increase to storage size allowed developers to experiment with detailed, large-scale worlds. Just Cause 2, for instance, features a map that's several hundred square kilometers in size. The advances to graphical tech also enabled developers to increase their focus on in-game narrative experiences. Higher polygon models, high-res skin textures, and enhanced animations allowed developers to push through the uncanny valley, at least part way. As a matter of fact, some franchises like Telltale's Walking Dead franchise and the Naughty Dog's The Last of Us relied on these advances to push story-centric experiences, spiritual successors of sorts to the FMV games of the early 90s. Overall, though, you do get the distinct feeling that progress is slowing down. The Nintendo Wii and Wii U were Nintendo's two entrants in this time frame. The Wii is chronologically a 7th gen console, and the Wii U is technically the first 8th gen console. However, in terms of capabilities, they were both an entire generation behind the competition. The Nintendo Wii's Hollywood GPU is essentially the GameCube's flipper, but clocked higher. The Wii's Broadway CPU, likewise, is an upclock variant of the one utilized by the GameCube. Consequently, the Wii offers 12 G-flops of compute, around 5% of what the real 7th gen consoles could deliver. Nevertheless, this meant that the Wii had more resources on offer than the GameCube. Certain titles like The Conduit and Red Steel pushed Wii hardware to the limits, and delivered visuals that weren't too far off from early 7th gen titles, albeit running at 480p. The Wii U arrived at the very end of the 7th generation in 2012, exactly a year before the PS4. At this point, the Xbox 360 was seven years old. 
The Wii U delivered 352 G-flops of compute, which makes it nominally faster than both the PS3 and Xbox 360. It also features 2GB of RAM, with 1GB allocated to games, four times as much as the PS3 and twice as much as the Xbox 360's unified memory pool. While its GPU capabilities were notably better, the Wii U's CPU was actually substantially slower than the 7th gen consoles. This meant that, in many cases, Wii U multi-platform games ran at a high resolution, as high as 720p, while often performing worse than the PS3 and Xbox 360 due to CPU bottlenecking. The 8th and 9th Generations – Progress, Finally? The early 8th generation was when video game innovation hit its lowest point. Both Sony and Microsoft cheaped out on their 8th gen hardware, delivering consoles that made the smallest leap so far in terms of technical capabilities. It's telling that a number of early 8th gen classics, Alien Isolation and Grand Theft Auto V for instance, ran fine on 7th gen consoles, albeit with compromised visuals. From a technical perspective, the issue was twofold. On the one hand, the increase in base resolution to 1080p meant that the 5 times increase in GPU capabilities didn't count for as much. On the other hand, CPU capabilities were incredibly limited on the 8th gen consoles. The PS3's cell CPU was actually faster in certain workloads than the PS4's Jaguar-based CPU setup. These issues were exacerbated on the original Xbox One. That console's 1.310 TFLOP GPU just wasn't powerful enough to consistently output 1080p visuals at a playable frame rate. Resolution Gate raged between 2013 and 2014, as a number of AAA developers opted for a 900p frame buffer on the Xbox One, while PS4 owners got a crisp, native 1080p. The PS4's faster 1.84 TFLOP GPU simply had more headroom. The newer Xbox One S features a slightly enhanced GPU, delivering 1.4 TFLOPs of compute. The extra 100 GFLOPs does make a difference. In games with a dynamic frame buffer, the Xbox One S often runs closer to a native 1080p than the original Xbox One. The poor CPU performance on both consoles, though, meant that attempts at next-gen gameplay often failed miserably. Assassin's Creed Unity is a case in point here. This resulted in year after year of stagnation. 8th gen titles looked better than 7th gen titles and ran at higher resolutions and enhanced frame rates, however, far too many franchises reheated the exact same gameplay tropes and approaches we've been seeing now for years. At this low point for console innovation, Nintendo switched things up, pardon the pun, with the Nintendo Switch. By 2017, mobile hardware had gotten to the point that the fastest mobile chips like Nvidia's Tegra X1 and Apple's A11 delivered CPU and GPU performance exceeding the 7th gen consoles at sub 5W consumption. Nintendo leveraged a semi-custom version of the Tegra X1 in the Switch, delivering one T-flop of compute when docked, which isn't too far behind the Xbox One. However, the Switch's relatively weak A57 CPU votes hold it back somewhat. Overall though, the Switch manages to deliver passable versions of AAA 8th gen titles and enhanced ports of 7th gens, all available on the go. The mid-cycle refresh consoles, the Xbox One X and PS4 Pro did little to change this. They simply enabled existing titles to look acceptable on 4K displays. The 6 TFLOP Xbox One X did a better job. Many multi-platform titles run at either a native 4K, a dynamic resolution that's in the neighborhood, or 1800p, which delivers almost all the sharpness. The PS4 Pro, though, may do with a 4.2 TFLOP GPU. Graphics capabilities were doubled relative to the PS4. However, the target resolution, 4K, was four times as great. In practice, this meant that the majority of PS4 Pro titles either delivered a 1440p frame buffer or used frame reconstruction techniques to deliver an approximation of 4K. The 9th gen consoles deliver roughly twice the GPU power and over four times the processing power of the refresh consoles, thanks to Moore's Law. However, progress does add up, even if it's gradual. The Xbox Series X, with its 12.15 TFLOP GPU, delivers 50 times the raw performance of the Xbox 360, 32 times the memory, and storage that's two orders of magnitude faster. The 10.28 TFLOP PS5 isn't that far behind. This is at least as big a leap as the one the 360 and PS3 delivered over the 6th gen consoles. 
we've seen almost exactly the same gameplay paradigms for over 15 years. The enhanced technical capabilities of the 9th gen consoles might finally enable something that approaches a true generational leap, and we look forward to seeing what that entails. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.